welcome to the Actor and Agent podcast with me, Jen, and... Me, Snajina. <laughs> That's absolutely fine. Um, so how to even introduce our guest today? I mean, he is a man of thousands and thousands of voices, both in profession and also in real life. He could give Robin Williams a run for his money. He's been in Deep Breath. I won't, uh, I'll try not to say all of them, but he's been in the newest Rugrats TV series as a narrator, Lego Star Wars, all of them, uh, F is for Family, My Little Pony, Thundercats, Roar, Avengers Assemble TV series, Rocket Raccoon in Guardians of the Galaxy TV series, and many, many, many more. It's Trevor Duvall. We, yeah, yes, it is. Hello. Wow. Hello. I, I, I'd forgotten half what of that. intro. Yeah, no kidding. No, wow. I was so excited. I was like... <laughs> You make well, me sound so I mean, important. It's a, <laughs> well, you are. You are. Um, I mean, I, obviously, I've known you for a while, but uh, it's always very exciting when I do look at your IMDb and I'm like, holy shit, look at all that. <laughs> I've been lucky. I've been lucky in my career. Yeah. Well, and be, also sure. talented, but we'll, you know, <laughs> humble as, well, you know. Um, so how are you? How are you doing? I'm um, okay. You know, I'm okay. I'm uh, yeah, living my best life. I don't know what the kids say. You know, I'm fine. It's all fine. <laughs> Hashtag winning? I don't know. Uh, yes, I don't know. Yeah. I'm trying to think. Can you still yeah, say okay. tiger blood? <laughs> I don't know. Tiger blood. Yeah, no, we, know we shouldn't one, say that. Sure. No, no. That's, that's not a good reference. <laughs> oh, right. Well, fair enough. That doesn't matter. But what, what, have, you, what have you been up to recently? Because, um, I mean, well, what, what can you tell us that you've been up to recently? What have you been up to? Uh, Work-wise, um, anything. <laughs> uh, we finished the fifth and final season of F's for Family recently, which is mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> sad. It's always sad to come to the end, uh, but this was uh, easily one of the one of my like crown jewels in terms of my career. It was always my my. My dream, it was my dream, to always be able to, to do uh, what they call utility work, which is where you play a bunch of characters, uh, oh, none man. of the main ones, uh, but to be a utility guy on an adult uh, comedy animated show. And so when I came to L.A., well, it got eight years ago now, and uh, mm -hmm. fell into it because Michael Price, the creator, is also the creator of Lego Star Wars, where I worked with him playing Emperor of Palpatine. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, he brought me on, and it's been five seasons, and it's just been fantastic. It's been fantastic. So it's always sad coming to the end, uh, but you know, onwards and upwards, and on to the next thing, and all that. Is it the end end? Yeah. Or is it just? It's yeah, really the, the end, end end. end. Yeah, done. Oh. Oh. Five and out, which is pretty good. I mean, five seasons of any show in animation is like, yeah. you know, we can't all be The Simpsons. Yeah. <laughs> it just keeps no, going exactly. on and on and on. No, no. <laughs> Same with Family Guy. I don't even know how many oh, series that is. Yeah, I, I mean, I've lost track years ago. Yeah, to be honest, I haven't even watched it. I haven't watched I mean, anything really. I've become this crazy right. YouTube junkie, which I never thought would happen. But I, <laughs> I, I just watched YouTube now, and it's always the same stuff. And I'm like, I remember TV. I remember professionally produced <laughs> shows, but I haven't yeah, seen them in so thing? long. Yeah. Well, I yeah. guess that eliminates the question of what, what have you been watching lately? <laughs> <laughs> what What did we finish? We just, well, of course, during the pandemic, we were at home doing nothing but watching stuff. Uh, mm. So we went through a bunch of stuff. Oh, you know what? Peaky Blinders. Oh, my God. Peaky Blinders. That was the oh. thing we stumbled on. That's like yeah. one of the greatest shows ever. Have you seen it? Do you know what, do you know what it is? I know. I, I haven't watched it yet. I know. I know. It's great. It's, <laughs> but I know. I know it's like iconic. I it know is. Like yeah. 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 It's fantastic. Um, it's what else? Stylized. My My girlfriend convinced me to watch all of Supernatural, which I'd never seen. And I was oh, always wow. like, CW. Um... I'm a little too manly sure male for the CW. <laughs> but we watched it, and I was like, actually, this is kind of awesome. And then we, so we've watched it all the way up to the last whatever, like the last mini season they did before they had to shut down. So we've got like six episodes left, and I'm like, I don't want to watch it because I don't want it to be over. <laughs> oh, like, okay, we do like <laughs> nice. one a day, try and spread out. Yeah, That's I mean, because there was like 18 seasons or something. So we just like constantly were watching Supernatural. That's like but... the Vancouver 
like staple shows. It totally <laughs> is, and it was it was so yeah. funny because every episode I'd be like, "Oh, John. Oh, Peter. Yeah. Oh, hey, he's doing his old tricks again." And she's like, yeah, "Would yeah. you stop pointing out all the people you know?" I'm like, "I can't help it. I, <laughs> I know all these people." It's a Vancouver show. Like, it's a Vancouver I show. I do that too, and my partner's like, "Okay, we get it. You know." Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I find it weird. It really takes me out of it when I see somebody I know in any show. I remember what I saw. Saving Private Ryan and Nathan Fillion showed up because I knew him from back in the Edmonton days. Uh, I directed Jen. him in his last <laughs> amateur performance. And I saw him come on the screen and I was like, Nathan? Oh, okay. And then he plays this thing and I'm like, oh, Nathan, you're mumbling again. I told you not to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Forgive me, I'm just dying over here. Just, just yeah, I can see your face. <laughs> I'm such a geek, and Nathan Fillion is just. Oh, that's you didn't you didn't know that I knew him? No. Oh well, surprise. I, <laughs> I mean, I haven't know. talked to him in years, but, but yeah, no, I directed well, him in a play called I'm... Zastrozzi, which was back in '93. Uh, that was right before he got headhunted by uh, was it One Life to Live? I think was the soap he was on. So we oh, closed okay. the show, and the next day he was on a plane to New York. So, yeah, he, yeah, it was wow. pretty cool. Oh, man. Oh, that's so crazy. It just shows just how small the industry really is and, like, oh, how, yeah. you know, people just know each other. Mm -hmm. You don't even... Although I, d I don't know these people. I know you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's great because I always get really excited because, like, obviously, um, I, uh, obviously, I watched your uh, interview with Crossing the Line guys and right. I was like that's my friend and I was <laughs> <laughs> and I like got uh, my parents watched it and they were just like he is incredible I was like I know he's my friend uh, uh, you're, you're very kind you're very kind those, those guys were fun they were uh, they were fun they were just like this the whole time yeah I know I was watching, <laughs> watching their faces they're just like completely like how would we <laughs> I don't think they knew what to expect, so it's um, it, it is it is, oh, that's it amazing. is quite funny. No, it's, it's, it's really enjoyable. Um, so obviously, you know, outside of obviously, because we'll we'll get to like voiceover and blah blah blah, and all that fun stuff. But like, is there anything that you're working on specifically that you're like super passionate about? It could be anything, even outside of the industry. Is there yeah. something that you're really really into? Yeah. Um. I mean, talk about uh, geek uh, culture. Uh, I've got this. I know you know about this. I've got this uh, YouTube show called Me, Myself, and Die, which is um, mm. uh, me playing uh, basically D&D &D by myself. Uh, and uh, originally it was done as largely a joke. Turns out there's a whole community of people that were like, no, no, this is really good. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so uh, it kind of took off, and that's what I'm doing. But it turns out I love it because I get to play all the characters. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> yeah, so it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's fun. So I love that. I just finished the second season. Uh, I've got a very successful Patreon now that, you know, all these people said, oh, start a Patreon. We want to throw money at you. I was like, why? But okay. Yeah. And so they did. And now I'm like, oh, I got to give them stuff now. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. let me give you extra things, extra things. Yeah, like, right. You must feel that extra pressure because you're like, oh, shoot. Like, yeah. Actually yeah, money. I do. And, and that's despite the fact that they've been very, very, very clear with me. All of them. Like, no, 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 no. You don't have to do anything else. Just keep doing what you're doing. But I'm still like... No, I got to give you something else. But that's actually good because it gives me its creative uh, inspiration to come up with some new stuff. And I've <clears throat> I came up with a bunch of different um, show ideas and stuff, all of which I'm going to be oh. starting when I get it to my new studio in a couple of months. So it's I'm actually, I am very excited about that. So that's going to be uh, yes. cool. And there is an immediacy to the YouTube thing, which I did not ever experience before. This is my first foray into into the whole world of that. And um, especially when I did my first live chat which was uh, something I said I'd never do. I said, I'm never going to go live on anything ever because it's too dangerous. It's too dangerous for me <laughs> <laughs> to go live. <laughs> but um, I did this live chat with the patrons, and it was really fun. Like, it was, for one thing, the community is tremendously positive and tremendously helpful and just great. They're all excellent. Mm -hmm. um, so to have that, in addition to the immediacy of just asking or answering questions they have, it's just been like a totally new experience for me, which something much different than the conventions, which I used to do in the, in the before time, before the pandemic hit, you know, because when then the questions were, yes, yeah, the, the questions were, <clears throat> you could all 
they were always the same, right? There's always the same four or five questions that fans ask you. So much so mm -hmm. that back in 2004, I started a podcast, one of the very first podcasts actually called uh, Voice Print with Trevor DeValle guests. And it was me interviewing my voiceover colleagues. Basically, the idea was we bring the convention to the listener. So I would take mm -hmm. questions uh, and then have the guest answer them and do all that stuff. That was... That was a lifetime ago. I actually used to listen to it. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yes. God, it must be um, so dated now. Well, I mean, I, I listened to it at the time when we first became friends. So and I found it really fascinating to listen to all of your episodes and all the people you were interviewing. Because people, they were people that I'd kind of come into contact with or knew of. So I was like, ooh, interesting. And then also hearing you talk more, I'm like... <sighs> yeah, oh, they... they uh, I mean, it was really... Dare I say it was an honor to be able to um, interview my my colleagues, but they they were the they were the the, the shining stars of the Vancouver um, voiceover scene. So to be able to sit down and share their stories and stuff, it, it was it was great. I love, we did like thirty six episodes or something of that over the Ooh. course of the years, which was not very much in podcast terms. But for me, that was that well, if I can get one every couple months, that's <laughs> that's pretty good. Yeah. So yeah, people always right. clamored to bring it back, but I'm like, uh, I always said, oh, well, one day I'll do Voice Print USA, but I just, I never did. I got too busy, and then, <laughs> and then I started playing D&D &D by myself, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, for anyone who doesn't really understand, how on earth would you pay, play D&D &D by yourself? Can you explain <laughs> that to, like, the layman person? Sure. So first of all... Cool. Uh, it's not technically D&D what I play, but it's a, a fantasy role-playing game where you play a certain fantasy character in a fantasy environment and the character is guided by statistics and you resolve actions that the character wants to do through the roll of dice. So that's what a normal sort of game is. And in a normal game, you have a GM, a games master, who is sort of the world, right? So the players just play themselves, they play, or not themselves, they play their characters, and then the GM is the world. That's everybody else in it, that's the force of nature, that's everything. Um, so in what they call solo role-playing, which is apparently what I'm doing. I didn't even know there was a term for it, but um, <laughs> you have, instead of uh, one player, or instead of a series of players and one GM, you have just one person who is taking over all of those roles, and the GM, the Game Master, is emulated by something called a GM emulator, and that is a series of charts and tables and dice rolls. So what it were, how it would happen is if, uh, you know, my character finds himself in a certain situation and I don't know what's going to happen, I ask the emulator and I say, what are the odds that, uh, you know, the character of Simon is about to be outnumbered by these town guards who are coming from? I think it's pretty good. So I look, it's, it's very likely. So I look in the very likely column and it gives me a percentage number and I roll and either it comes up basically yes or no and then I proceed from there. And there's random events that happen out of the blue, which you just kind of, you know, if you roll a doubles on the table, that's a random event. And then you look at the random event table and you randomly determine what that is. And it could be something like, you know, attack faith. Okay, well, what does that mean in this exact moment? Attack faith. Uh, it's, a, it's a priest. It's a priest who's leading this band of, uh, of, of flagellants <laughs> who are uh, going to attack. And, that's, and then you build the world that way, sort of one choice at a time. And it grows and grows and grows and grows and grows. And it forms into a coherent narrative because you're, you're, tracking, you're tracking all of the, um, what they call NPCs, the non-player characters in the world. You're tracking the choices of the character himself. Um, and you're tracking the world as it's being built, and suddenly things start to make sense later that didn't make sense beginning because you can tie elements together and go, oh, now I know where that priest came from. He was a priest of this church, and now they're tied into this thing, and next thing you know, you're at the end, and people are weeping, going, oh, it was so moving. So that's good. <laughs> <clears throat> that was, like, so, so much fun, actually. It is. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Like, it's... Yeah. It's so different, but it's cool. I like the random aspect of it. Yeah, yeah and honestly, really like, that GM emulator is something that authors use or screenwriters can use because oh. all it does is is trigger your imagination and, um, and f help uh, keep your thoughts organized, your creative thoughts organized in such a way that makes sense to you. So it's, it's nothing other than a tool for coming up with ideas and making sure they all are cohesive. So it's, it's a mm -hmm. fantastic tool for more than just gamers. It's, you know... Writers, screenwriters, the whole bit. Wow, interesting. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, no, that's a, that's a whole new level of geekery that I've never got into, but I love it. <laughs> I'm I like, personally love it. My mind went, ding, Jen, what are we going to play next time we're together? <laughs> well, it'd be interesting to give it a go. Like, I've, you know, and it's funny because um, after, after my parents watched your uh, interview with Crossing the Line, they watched the first episode to me, myself, and Di. <laughs> 
the other day. And they were sat there and like, mum was like, oh, I wondered what was going to happen. And I was like, oh, wow, it's actually really quite exciting. And I was like, interesting. Whereas dad was like, it's quite hard to follow. Whereas like, whereas like my mum was like, wow. But dad was like, oh, okay, this is interesting. But mum was like, look at all the dice. There's so many dice. And I was like, and I was like oh. but yeah, this is just from... But, you know, considering we've never been exposed to it, it's quite, it's really quite interesting because it's just something, well, yeah, something so cool. Anyway, I think it's cool. (laughs) Sorry, got weirded myself out there. Right, um, so, (laughs) um, so, okay, so what was I going to say next? I literally got, I got so sidetracked by thinking about everything else, I got completely off, off the topic. Anyway, so, um, yes, drink, hydrate. Drink, drink of it. Yes. <clears throat> um, so, obviously, you've worked a lot. Mm-hmm. Obviously, because like you know, you look at your IMDb and you could just you could give yourself carpal tunnel by scrolling. <laughs> but um, uh, you know, is there a specific character or project that you enjoyed working on the most, regardless of whether it was successful or not? Is there something? I mean, I've, I know obviously you said how much you enjoyed Efforts for Family. Would that be the one, or is there something else, or that would be the one? You think? Uh, it's so hard to say that. <laughs> I mean. <clears throat> You know, like like any parent, I love all of my children equally. So it's uh, uh, yeah, it's tough. It's tough. Um, and I I could say sort of the 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 stupid actor response, which is, well, I treat every character as though it's my favorite. But that's kind of true. <laughs> that is kind of true because when you're in the moment and you're playing the character, you're inhabiting the character, and that's that's what you know. And and if you if you hit those beats you know you have to hit as an actor, you walk away going, yeah, I did that. But uh, ironically, I kind of hate watching my work because I'm, I'm, I'm a bit like Michael Caine that way. I can't watch myself, <laughs> can I? No, I can't. <laughs> it drives me mad. Whenever I watch like cartoons I'm doing, I'm like, ugh, all I hear is the mistakes and like the, the choices I would go back and change and I'm hypercritical of my own work. So. Oh. Wow. Yeah. That's so interesting. I wouldn't have thought that for you. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, uh, I have a, dreadful uh, uh, imposter syndrome. I've had that my whole life. I always feel like, uh, yeah, no, I'm not really that good at this. This One day they're going to find out and they're going to be like, uh, excuse like I'm the, the big fear is always that one day the, the men in suits from the government, from society, are going to come to the door and knock on the door and say, uh, yes, no, you've been uh, playing around for too long. It's time to get a real job. And I'll go, okay, you know. <clears throat> so, Let's hope not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well. Keep playing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But in terms of favorite will- characters, uh, I loved playing Emperor Palpatine for Lego Star Wars. That was, it, it's so great. And, and what's really awesome about that is that um, <laughs> they, they keep bringing me back. Even though the Emperor, like the Emperor in our Lego Star Wars universe has died, I don't know how many times now, but they keep bringing him back because they're like, mm. we just love <laughs> what you do. So they will literally, they will write me in and they'll say, you know, here's the script, but just... Just you know, you do you. You just you you know the character. You you just I'm like okay, so I'll just riff, <laughs> and then, then oh most of that stays God. in. <laughs> so that's awesome. They've been telling me they're trying to get me a series for for years now. They're like, we really want the emperor to have his own series. And I'm like, well, that makes two of us. But <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we'll see. They're awesome. The, the Lego guys are are they're fantastic. That whole crew, they're just uh, so much fun. But he was he was a lot of fun, mostly because of the evolution. Because it started out as as a voice match. When we did the audition, this was in Vancouver. I started in, with the Yoda Chronicles, which was uh, back in yes. 2010 or whenever we did the first one. Um, <clears throat> and when the audition came around, I saw these. I'm like, oh, these are the Star Wars characters. So uh, they wanted voice matches, and I was like, okay, well, I can, you know, I can do, like, I can do Obi Wan, and I can do, you know, Han Solo, and I can do you know, the Emperor and stuff. Well, they booked me as the Emperor, and I was like, okay, well, I'll be ready, uh, Lord Vader. You know, I was ready to do that thing, and then we we get in there, and I realize. Oh, this is Lego. This is a comedy. So, you know, the Emperor will be from being very serious to being sort of, yeah, like a combination between Mark Hamill's Joker and Stewie Griffin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, zappity, zappity. Yeah. And uh, it was awesome. And he just sort of evolved into madness from there. So, yeah. He's my favorite at the moment, I'd say. Oh, funny. That's a, that's a great favorite, to be honest. It's, uh... <laughs> That is a great favorite. Well, both both um, Sneji and I really, really enjoy um, Star Wars. So, I mean, any kind of any kind of homage to that in any kind of uh, way is just is just pure joy. I love the fact that you were, and I do like that when you've got the freedom to be able to to go with it and lean into whatever you want to do with the character. Because when it yeah. is just a, a voice match, it's a bit like. I mean, obviously, it's still good, 
but then you're like, oh, it's not really my own. Yeah. Yeah, and different. I mean, I've had different experiences with different producers and different kinds of shows and everything like that. Um, it's it's been largely my experience that with video games, they <clears throat> they prefer you stick very much to the script um, for all kinds of reasons. They've got whole teams of people who are you know busy animating your eyebrow. So it's you know they have a very very <laughs> specific way yeah. of doing things. So they're a little less lenient with with riffing. That's not always the case, you know. But <clears throat> mostly that seems to be the case. Whereas with animation. Although, you know, like the Everster family guys, they would allow you to riff for sure, but then they'd be like, okay, that was Oz, that was so funny. Now let's go back to as written. <laughs> okay, okay, we'll do it as you want it, okay. But uh, they would always let us play, and sometimes those, those made it into the show. Um, yeah, Everster for family, I'm so sad it's over, because it was, it was just like so, so good, so much good. And to be able to work with guys like Bill Burr, um, mm. <clears throat> he, he's just awesome. He's just awesome. He was... Yeah. I, he was sort of my first brush with like celebrity in LA because, like I said, I I booked the job very soon after I got here, and mm -hmm. uh, so, and I I knew who he was. I had heard of him, but I wasn't like a huge fan or anything. So when I met him, I wasn't like oh starstruck. But then I, yeah. I booked the job and then I watched his specials. I was like oh yeah no he's he's the real thing. He's like this, he's the comedian's comedian in many ways, you know, and uh, <clears throat> I remember. When we were when we were doing the first couple of sessions, uh, and he's just super nice. He's super on the level. He's exactly you know like there's no no pretension about him at all. He's he's great. But uh, when I was first dating my girlfriend, um, was it was right around this time, and it was like two months into our relationship. So you know I'm still trying very hard to be impressive with it and all that stuff. Uh, but. Uh, there was this thing called the Long Hard Comedy Jam that they did on Sunset Boulevard, which was comics, like, you know, famous comedians go up and they do their bit, but then they have to sing a song, which is totally outside of their experience, but that's kind of the point, is that now they have to do something that they're totally uncomfortable with. Mm -hmm. So it was going to be Jim Jeffries and Russell Peters and uh, Bill, Bill Burr and uh, some other wow. people. And it was going to be, it was Monday and it was going to be tomorrow night. It was going to be Tuesday night. And Nisa's looking at her, her uh, laptop and she's like, oh, this would be really great to go to. I'm like, well, uh, maybe let's get some tickets. And she's like, oh, it's sold out. I'm like, ah, oh, that's too bad. And I went, hang on a minute. And I texted <laughs> Bill and I said, hey, buddy, Trevor, any chance you could get me like a couple of tickets for your show tomorrow night? Thinking there's no way this is going to happen. Before I put the phone down, brr, done. I'm like, oh. oh. So I turned to her. I'm like, um... We're going to the show tomorrow. And she's like, how did you get tickets? And I'm like, Bill Burr just told me that we have tickets. And she's like, what? what? So then we go down to the place on Sunset the next night, and we're walking. There's a big line, and I'm walking up to the window going, okay, well, it's going to take a while to get in. And they give us our special badges. And I'm, I'm about to walk to the back of the line. The bouncer goes, oh, no, 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 sir, you come with us. And I'm like, what? So they escort us into the room. And we're sitting there. Uh, at the area, and beside Jim Jeffries, there's Jim. He's like, hello. <laughs> hello ah. Jim. And we sit down, our name on the table the whole bit. And I'm, I realize, oh, we're in like the VIP section in the booze where they're bringing us the booze. And the, ah. the agents are here. And the other cop, Russell Peters, walked by. And I'm like, what's going on right now? This is so bizarre. And then Bill came in. Hi, Trev. Thanks for coming. I'm like, thank you're thanking me for coming? No, thank you for the... No, it's good, man. I just go for a good, good beach. He, he always remembered her name years after. He's one of those guys, Aww. you know? So, and then the show was great, and I was just like, this is... Wow, I couldn't look better right now. I yeah, exactly. <laughs> you like set a certain standard, and then it's like, yeah. okay. Yes. This is the bar that I will continuously <laughs> fail to meet from this point on. <laughs> Oh, no. Oh, my gosh. Wow. That must have been, in that must have been insane. Jeez. What was, yeah. I've, see, I've obviously, I've never heard of, I've never heard of that show before. Like, was it, did, what did you say? It, was, the... it was called the Long Hard Comedy Jam, and it started off oh it, as just a local thing in L.A., but I think at some point years ago, they, they turned it into a TV show, or they tried to do it as a pilot or something, but it was just sort of a local thing that happened in, in Hollywood where, in West Hollywood where, just people knew. Oh yeah, you go to this thing and you do the thing. You know, it's it's like everything in in West Hollywood. You just have to know. You just have to know <laughs> what's happening. So yeah, yeah it was oh. fun. <clears throat> All that wow. to say, he's yeah, a great guy, insane. and it was it was, it yeah. was my privilege to have known him. Oh, well, I'm sure there will be other opportunities to work with Bill Burr again because obviously you've got Perhaps. you've got a you know a good rep 
rapport? A rapport, yeah. I was like, I'm going to wait well, for her to get it. <laughs> I, I don't know if I would say I have a good rapport with him. As much as I like him and as much as he's decent to me, we have nothing in common. <laughs> like our conversations, oh, really? our conversations would do this. <laughs> because he's like a big sports guy and I don't know anything oh like you know he would say ah you see that Eagles game I'm like is that the one with the bat I don't know like you know so he's <laughs> our first like real conversation was uh, we're, we're at uh, the studio in the in the break room basically and he says uh, so uh, Trev you see that Patriots game the other night there and I'm like uh, actually I'm not much of a not much of a sports guy oh okay uh Hey, you're still riding that motorcycle, all right? Yeah, yeah, still riding it. Yeah, you be careful. That's lots of crazy people out here in L.A. I'm like, I know, I know. <laughs> Awkward silence. Okay, well, I'll see you later. All right, see you later, Bella. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he was always he was always super great. Like when we would meet at table reads or something, he would always like, dude, did you see Rogan the other night? He had this guy, and we we talk about that and stuff. But in terms of like like small talk, just nothing. <laughs> Oh, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Anyway, enough. Enough of that. Enough of that. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Um, one thing. So this is just something random that I didn't even plan to say, but um, <coughs> but I saw it on your IMDb, and I just had to ask because I saw the movie the other day. Um, you did ADR on Unhinged. What on earth kind of ADR did you do on Unhinged? I don't even know what that is. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's sorry, Russell Crowe, but it's a terrible movie that was recently released like horrendous and it's like this <laughs> forever but it's like <clears throat> it's so bad and uh it's like uh this guy who gets road rage which is russell crowe oh he gets yeah road i rage, remember the trailers like, for that yeah but so but apparently you're credited to do adr on it and i was like he did what on the what what have you done okay well I... there you go Not <laughs> i even guess i know. did <laughs> i guess i All did right. Yeah, uh, that happens a lot where people say, oh, I really, you know, I loved your work in X and X and such and such. And I'm like, uh, what yes. year was that? Because <laughs> unfortunately, and this is why I'm a terrible, uh, I'm terrible at conventions is because I don't remember the stuff I do most of the time. It's fire and forget. I just go in. Mm -hmm. I'll say, okay, what do you need? Uh, you need? We need this. Okay. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Uh, see, I got to go to the next one. And then that's it. I've forgotten all about it. Um, I remember the big ones. I remember the series, obviously, but yeah, yeah, stuff yeah. like that. That could have been that could have been like a a loop group thing, a Walla group thing. When yeah, we're doing maybe. background voices, I do some of that uh, out here, so that's possible. I don't know. I, <laughs> I don't okay, know. <laughs> well, no, it was just one of those things. That I was just like, as I was going, I was like, huh, interesting, random. Yeah. Okay, um, you know, but then, then it stuck in my mind because I saw the movie not too long ago. But anyway, well, if you can't remember, then that's completely <laughs> fine. Um, <laughs> sorry, that's such a random thing for me to think of. Um, actually, out of curiosity, because like when, because I know obviously we knew each other before you made the decision to go to LA. Um, for, oh, I know this is a, an interesting topic, but like, how how did it get to the point where you realised, okay, I need I need to move from Vancouver to kind of to make to make it bigger, I guess, because obviously you needed to, did there become like a point where you were like, ah, I think I need to go. I think I need to do this. No, uh, I had okay. no desire to go to LA at all. Zero, hmm. zero. I had, um, a great career in Vancouver. I was one of the, one of the boys up there, one of the team doing all the animation. Mm -hmm. Cause in van there's like, well, at least when I was up there all those years ago, <laughs> there was like, I don't know, <clears throat> 25 or 30 of us that did everything. So it was like, yeah, I've, I've arrived. I've got a great life. I work with these great people. I get paid very well. I'm good. I'm good. But then um, <clears throat> I did a show called Big Time Movie, which was a live action movie for Nickelodeon, which was shooting in Vancouver. And the only reason why I did that is because the producer of that was also the producer of Johnny Test, which I was on playing Dookie. And he needed to cast the British villain because <clears throat> the whole thing takes place in London. And he needed, he needed like the full on James Bond villain white suit pet. You know, cat petting yes, I was bit. about to say, this is you in a white suit. That's right. right. That's right. That's a big time <laughs> yeah. movie. So he, he wanted to cast me that. I'm like, you know, Scott, I'm, I'm a voice guy, right? Like, face for radio? Like, it's really not what we should be. <laughs> and he said, oh, no, no, you're perfect. You're perfect. I totally... And I was like, oh, okay. So I did it, and it was just an incredible experience. So much fun. We shot in Vancouver and Victoria for a month, and it was great. It was fantastic. <clears throat> but after that, he said to me, 
oh my God, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna totally pitch you to the executives of Nickelodeon. They're gonna love you. You come on down there and, and have a meeting. I'm like, Scott, I can't work in the States. I'm Canadian, I don't have a green card, I don't have papers, that's all. He's like, oh, I'm gonna set up a meeting. I'm like, sure you are, Mr. Producer. Yeah, you, you set up yeah. your meeting. I'll be holding my breath on that one. <laughs> and a week later, I get an email from Nickelodeon, from uh, uh, wow. Sarah Noonan, was it? I think she was in charge of casting at the time. She's like, oh, we just, Scott just goes on and on about you and we just love to have you come down for a meeting. I'm like, uh, okay. <gasps> So I go down there, and I'm sitting in Nickelodeon surrounded by SpongeBob SquarePants paraphernalia, yeah. going, what am I doing here? This is a waste of time. I can't work down here. And uh, mm. so I had a meeting with her. She was great. She took me into the booth. I did my thing. She comes out, gives me a big hug. She says, what can we do to get you down here? I'm like, uh, I don't know. And then uh, I, I go talk to Scott because he was editing the film at, at Paramount. He says, come on out of the studio. And the studio was Paramount. So I oh drive God. down to Paramount Studios and, oh, Mr. Deval, your parking space is this way. I'm like, <laughs> so I go and I see him and he's shown me cuts of the film. Oh, my God, you're the fucking funniest thing in the movie. Oh, my God. So we're laughing about that. And then we're, he's taken me on a personal tour of, of, uh, of Paramount in a golf cart. And he's, he's a real cinephile, so he's like pointing out where this happened in Hollywood history and stuff. And I'm like, that's pretty cool right here, I gotta say. And he says, so what are you gonna do, buddy? You gonna come down? I'm like, I can't work down here. Ah, you'll figure that out. You'll figure it out. I'm like, uh, okay. And then, right before, this is a four-day trip, by the way. Four days. Okay. And on the last day, I'm, I'm on the way to the airport, and I stop to have a friend, uh, have a friend, uh, have a lunch with a friend of mine who's down here. She's from Vancouver, and she's been mm -hmm. down here for a couple of years. And I tell her the whole story, and she says, so what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know. I'm going to go home and go back to work. And she said, are you out of your mind? She said, do you know how many actors get the opportunity you've just, they've just rolled out the red carpet for you, and you're just going to ignore it? And I was like, but, she said, you're at the top of your game. You don't have a wife, a kid. Oh God! No, she said you don't have. You don't. <laughs> she said you don't have any dependents. You don't. You, you're you're totally you know free to go wherever you want, and you've just been invited to come down and play in the biggest playground in the world. Mm -hmm. She said, "Here's the name of my lawyer. He's going to get you your green card." And I went, "Okay." So I called the dude right away. He calls me back. He's like, "You need to." Under he was in Toronto, but he's like Atlanta, Toronto, cross border immigration lawyer. This is back mm -hmm. in 2011, I think. <clears throat> and he says, okay, well, you know, it's very, very difficult for Canadians to get green, green cards. They're trying to get the green cards all the time, especially in performance. And you have to show that you've got 10 criteria that you meet and you have to be the best in the world, blah, blah, blah. And I was the whole time going, yeah, okay, I know. No, this is never going to happen, never going to happen. He said, so you meet all of these requirements. And I went, what? He said, yeah. He said, you're a perfect candidate for this. I'm like, okay, well... Oh, let's apply. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. Every step of the way, I thought they're going to reject me, reject me, reject me. <clears throat> and it never happened. And then cut to a year later when I'm going across the border with my, with my new green card, showing it to the, to the immigration, the customs officer, thinking, well, this is it. This is the last chance to reject me. It's going to happen now. <laughs> and the guy, he opens up my, my package. You know, he's, he's got his customs face on. Very, very serious. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And he comes and he pulls out my paper. He goes, dude. You're Dookie on Johnny Test? I'm like, yeah. He's like, yo, you're in my living room every day. Welcome to America. I'm like, this is the golden ticket right here. This is unbelievable. Wow. So, yeah, there I was in Studio City, still saying to myself, I'll be here a year. I'll, I'll get a, you know, a commercial. Maybe I'll do a guest spot in a Disney princess show. And then I'll go home and that'll be that. I can say, yeah, I lived in L.A. But I didn't really have an agent at the time, and I was like, ah, it's probably not going to work. And then I have a meeting, because of friends, with Andrea Romano, who's like one of the biggest directors in animation. And we sit down mm -hmm. at Starbucks. I'd worked with her years ago once on a Tom and Jerry special. That's how she knew me. And she said, mm -hmm. you're too good to be wasting your time with these other agents here. I'm going to make a phone call to SBV, and uh, they're going to call you. You need to work with them. And I was like, okay. I didn't know who they were. Turns out they're one of the top agencies in, in town. I get a phone call from them an hour later. Um, yeah, Andrea Romano never refers people. Can you come in, like, now? Can you come in now and meet us? I'm like, okay. So I walk in. And they're like, we'd love to sign you. I'm like, okay. So then I'm auditioning with them for a month, and I book, uh, I book my first job after a month. I remember this, too. I'm sorry, wow. I'm rambling, but this is... No, please do. It's no, lovely. it's great. <laughs> so I I've been auditioning for a month. A whole month, mind you. That's 30 days without a job? Please. <gasps> so, 
So, <laughs> so on the on the like the fourth week, I'm saying to the booth director because I was I was going into the to the agency to audition uh, from there because I didn't have my booth set up yet, and uh, and uh, Mike Carr was his name, uh, the booth director at the time. He's now an agent uh, in his own right, but uh, I said to him, "Oh man, I just." I just can't seem to book anything. He said, how long have you been here? I said, I've been here a month. He goes, just um, just give it a minute. Maybe just give it a minute. And that audition I booked, the next day I booked that one. That was my first wow. job. And then wow. I think a couple weeks later I booked Rocket Raccoon. And then it was off to the races basically from that point on. But uh, yeah, it was, uh, it, was, it was quite a ride. But all to point back to your original question, which is I didn't want to come here. I had no desire to go to the States, no desire to go to L.A. at all. To me, it was like, nah, 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 nah. nah but I L.A. Know, wanted you to come to it. <laughs> Apparently so. And it was so Tim bad. Curry. <laughs> yeah, and it was Tim Curry who, who said, I think it was Tim Curry who said, um, you know, you, you don't go to L.A. unless you've been invited. And I guess he was right, you know, because that's that's pretty much happened to me. And it didn't stop there. The, the crazy luck just kept piling on because of... Um, <laughs> because of Guardians of the Galaxy, I was suddenly introduced to the whole Marvel family, and then I was involved in all the other shows they were doing. And then, at one point, I had an idea for an episode for Guardians. And so I told Will Friedle, who played Star-Lord, we were having lunch at a, a dinner at his place one night, and I said, I got this idea for an episode. It's entirely from Groot's perspective. And every time anybody speaks, all they ever say is, I am, and then their name. Because that's what everybody says to him because he always says I am Groot right but in this time we hear his internal monologue and he's got this big Shakespearean way of thinking and the whole time we realize that Groot is actually this unbelievably intelligent guy but he just only communicates by saying I am Groot that's it because humans can only hear I am Groot except Rocket Rocket <laughs> understands that so anyway I had this idea for an episode that's all about Groot it's all about him and it's entirely from his perspective Rocket's not even in it he's there at the beginning and the end so I tell him this idea, and Will says, you have to pitch Marvel. I'm like, why would they listen to, to me? He's like, you're Rocket Raccoon. They're not just going to say no. And I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, I talked to Harrison, who's one of the executives at the time. I said, I got this idea for an episode. I tell him. He goes, great. You want to write it? I'm like, write it. No, I just kind of want to watch it. I'd like to see it. He's like, no, 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 you write it. But first, let's get you writing for Avengers. Do you want to write an Avengers episode? I'm like, okay. Next thing you know, I'm writing the season finale. I've done four episodes of Avengers. I got to write my Guardians episode. I'm writing the season finale for Avengers. It, it was just like yeah. one thing after another. And it was all about because I asked, well, may I, can I do this? And people went, yeah. And I was like, that I'll is ask. not something I'm used to at all. You know? Yeah. It was wild. No. It was a wild trip, man. <laughs> that is a wild trip. I mean... Uh, that's fu that's funny because I was actually going to talk. I was going to ask you about the, how you managed to like straddle the line between voiceover and then ended up writing on like you know a, I think it was a, was it Avengers Assemble. It was and Avengers Assemble no. and yeah, and Avengers Guardians and, and yeah. Guardians. Yes, which is which is insane to be honest. Yeah, like that's just mental. And the fact that it just came up by you being like over lunch, like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if like <laughs> yeah, I know. you could see this episode? Wouldn't that be awesome? I mean, so how many well, episodes did you end up writing? Oh, sorry, Snedge. No, I was gonna say, well, the idea was really good, so yeah, <laughs> as exactly. Well. Yeah, it was it was clever. It was it was clever, and I was able. I mean, I didn't. I wasn't able to write that exact idea, but it was it was a version of the idea that that they managed to shoehorn into their season, which was awesome. I mean, I didn't even think it would get that far, but um, yeah, yeah. I I just um, I mean, I knew these people, and I just. I did it out of a place of naivete. I was like, well, I guess I'll just ask because, you know, I, that was my whole thing. Coming down here, I knew nothing about how the system worked. And I think somehow that came across as incredibly confident to people because I just didn't know any better. And so I'd be like, oh, yeah, well, of course I'm going to do this. And I'm, of course I'm going to play this role and do this thing. And people are like, oh, well, you must clearly be very successful. And I'm like, oh, okay, sure, I guess. And okay. then, yeah, so it was... Um, it's been a wild ride, but writers, uh, <laughs> writers hate my guts because of it. I remember because we were at a convention years ago, and I was telling the story about the, how you know how I started writing, writing for Marvel. And these writers, there's writers in the room, and they were said they were like, "I've been writing for 15 years, and I can't get anywhere near the gates of holy Marvel. And you just ask, and they get you to write." I'm like, "Hey, sorry." <laughs> anyway, it's been, it's been an interesting experience, that's for sure. 
Absolutely. Are you? Because I know, um, I know. When we've talked before, you you were writing something or a few things yourself. Are you still continuing to write for you to one day put something out there? Or? Yeah, we had done. Uh, me, I have a writing partner here, and I had an idea for a pilot uh, for a series, which I was really really excited about. And um, I got a I got a, a writing agent uh, uh, out of that. Mm. Um, wow. Again, it was just people who know people, and they went, "Oh yeah, no, let's yeah, I'll represent you." I'm like, okay. So uh, we wrote the pilot. It's really good, <laughs> and we we pitched it to a company, which is a pretty big company, and they loved it. And we sat down with them for an hour and a half, and they were talking about everything they loved about it. And um, they basically said, you know, we have to tweak a few things here and there. Da 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 da. They said, we they said we love this, but uh, we can't buy it because you're an unknown writer. And I was like, and therein lies. There's there's the real. There's the wall right there. It doesn't. So in animation, once you're in the group, it's a lot easier to maneuver within. But if you're trying mm -hmm. to exist outside the world, like if mm -hmm. you try to go to live action, that's a totally different world. So they don't recognize any of my credits from animation. To them, that doesn't even exist. Whereas in the on-camera world, they've got their own thing. So to me, or to them, I was a total unknown, total unknown commodity. I'd never done a thing, and I'm like. Well, I think that's a little unfair, but whatever. That's just the way it is. It's, it's the way they think. So uh, I still have this pilot sort of floating around out there. Maybe, maybe someday somebody will pick it up. But in the meantime, I got so, I, it was right around that time that I started doing me myself and die. So that became my big focus. Uh, of course. And uh, now that the channel is growing, um, I'll, that'll probably remain my focus for a while. But you never know. That's the yeah. thing about Hollywood, man. Is that twenty years later you get a call. Hey, the script we found at the bottom of the barrel. Oh, we, we love it. We want to do it. We want to buy it. Okay, you know, right. you never know. You never know. I'm still kind of holding out for Netflix to come to me about me, myself, and die and say we want to turn this into a show, you know, because it's Ooh. possible. It's possible. It's I have connections totally there and possible. stuff, so we'll see. We'll mm. see. Wow. Or maybe not. Maybe I'll just keep, you know, doing what I'm doing. Well, keep keep having the Patreon. Keep having all those people being like, oh, yeah, we will follow you. Yeah, you know, I mean, as like, long as it's of, fun, it's right? As long as it's fun for yeah. everybody, yeah. then that's, that's kind of biggest thing. Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. yes, long Absolutely. bloody answer, I'm afraid. No, but it's a no, great no. bloody it's answer. Great answer is what it is. Um, so I was just thinking, maybe because obviously looking at the time, do do we should, we could do we could do random questions. If you want, Snowshoe, sure. or is there anything yeah. in particular yeah, yeah, yeah. that you want? No, yeah, sure. Do you want? Do you want to go f first, or do you want me to? What would you? You go first. I was hoping you picked that top one. <laughs> oh, I, I picked a completely different one, so you can. Pick oh no, I liked that one. Okay, I'm gonna do that one oh, when no. you're done. Well, then you do that one. Okay, cool. Okay. All right, oh. Trevor. So. Um, we always do this where we have like a couple of like random questions at the end. Don't worry, they're not quick fire. You don't need to like <laughs> lightning be like, ah, these are the <laughs> yeah. So there's um, two. <laughs> but, but there's two. There's two questions. One from me and one for Snajina. <clears throat> um, so there's a zombie apocalypse and it's coming, right? Who are the three people that you want on your team? Well, clearly the two of you. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well. I mean, I'm good with, I'm really. good with guns. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'd be really good with a bat. I feel good. like well, I'm just going to yeah, be mental. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think the three of us could take them. Yeah. How's that? How's that for an answer, huh? <laughs> <laughs> that's probably the most... Uh, that's probably the most... Um, <laughs> difficult answer I think we've ever had. Um, we've never we've never had that. Uh, we've never had that question before. And I thought, oh, this would be an interesting question to ask Trevor. And then you're like... That's yeah. like, oh. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. the standard actor interview response, you know. Well, that's, that's completely fine. That's absolutely fine. Yeah. Cool. All right. Brilliant. <laughs> um, sh sh should we should we all answer or should we just go straight to the No, second? I don't have a good answer <laughs> yeah. for that. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Um, Brilliant. Go this one you can't one. this one you can't say yes. You um, can't you can't <laughs> <laughs> out of it. Um, what fictional family would you be a member of? Why does this is so awful? This is so awful that this is where my brain goes, because it's to me it's hilarious. It's so stupid, but my brain immediately goes, "Well, clearly the Manson family." That's like the first the word. Ah! That's where my brain goes right away. <laughs> that's, that's not even fictional. <laughs> I, I know. No, it's absurd <laughs> on every possible level. <laughs> Oh my god. Uh, what family oh god. would I what fictional family would I be a part of? <laughs> um <laughs> uh, uh, uh probably um 
Uh, I loved the new Lost in Space for Netflix they did. Uh, Aww, yeah, yeah. I, and I I picked them because that was uh, that that was a great show, and they were they were a very competent survivalist family, and I liked that. Yeah, mm, yes. agreed. That's nice. <laughs> That is we'll really take nice. it. We'll take that. It's the polar opposite of your initial <laughs> gut reaction, Bill. <laughs> Which was dark. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what's going on in here most of the time. So well, yeah, you're <laughs> answering these you just so quickly. Yeah, I'll ask you yeah. another one. Ooh, uh, nice. If you could be one age for the rest of your life, what would it be? Eight. 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 If I could Why? go back, and that's to, cute. If I could go back to being eight years old, I would do it in a heartbeat. Eight was the perfect age. Of course, we all look back with rose-colored glasses on certain things. But for me, I had the most idyllic childhood possible. It was it was uh, <clears throat> fantastic. Everything was great. If I could go back to eight, or if I couldn't go back to eight, I guess there's three. There's three eras. One is eight. The other would be. 12, which isn't that far, but there's a big difference between 8 and 12, obviously. Definitely. And I very much remember being 12 and just loving, loving, loving uh, everything. Or, failing that, um, 33. Because in my 30s, the 30s, in my early 30s, I, I had just started to sort of gain a little bit of wisdom in the world, but I was mm. still stupid enough to be able to do crazy things and and I had lots of money, <laughs> so I traveled the world with wild <laughs> abandon and basically had a party all through my 30s. And 33 was sort of the beginning of that, where I realized personal freedom for the first time, where I realized uh, I have... P- people look at me and, and they assume I know something, but I really don't. So there's, uh, there's some leverage there <laughs> I have. Mm. Um, when you get to your 40s, uh, the party shifts. It's a little different. A little different. You can do late 40s. You're, I think the party's over. So it's time to change things up here. But 33, <laughs> man, that was like, that was like, yeah, that was traveling the world, doing all that stuff. So, yes, three ages, 8, 12, wow. and 33. That's very specific. Jen? I love that. Me? Uh, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm currently Surprise! 33. what's your answer? <laughs> <laughs> I'm currently 33, and I'm not, I don't know, I'm not t- entirely sold on it. Yeah, well, actually, I'm almost 34, so. It's a well, bit of a different situation it. right now, but it's okay. <laughs> My whole 33 has been in the pandemic, so I'm hardly like, oh, let me laugh. Um, yeah, for me, I think if I could, if I if I really had to, uh Actually, yeah, I think 12 was a really good age. 12 was a solid age. I feel like I, you know, it was like just before things got super complicated and it was just really just enjoyable. I really agree with you actually there, Trevor. I'm not sure I remember enough for when I was eight, but from when I was 12, I was definitely like, I was like, oh, I want to be, I want to be a singer, but I was also too shy. So I'd go on stage and then shake like a leaf and everyone would feel <laughs> uncomfortable. So it was like the worst situation for me and everyone else. But I was like, oh, you know, I want to do this. I want to do that. But I was just too, I was so shy, but I was just like, I was so, I don't know. I just had a, just, I just had a really lovely time at, at 12. Yeah. That was great. What about you, Snej? Uh, two. Different ages, not two years. Oh, I thought you meant two years. Um, That's what I was like, wow. Before I knew what was going on. Um, No, um, 10, because I was so confident, and I thought I was going to be an actor, so I was always performing. I don't know where that went went away but I was just every memory that's good I'm like oh I was around 10 so (laughs) that just seems like it was a good time and then 18 because I graduated from high school and went to Hong Kong and stayed there for six months for and it was amazing and I had like the best experience so yeah that's me and right now isn't so bad for me either I mean it's pretty good time so I'll take now too (laughs) (laughs) Again, that's also quite a diplomatic answer there, Snushi. It's like, well, well sorry, no, too- but like, right now is good because I have my own yeah, business. I work for myself, yeah. you know. The sun yeah. is shining. Could be Got worse. a nice partner. You know? Could be yeah, worse. Could, could always be, yeah, worse. Yeah, could be worse. Usually what we say in my family is like, could be worse, could be stabbed. Um, because um, I think that's actually from Life of Brian. It's like, could be worse, could be stabbed. Um, and we just always seem to say that. Where anytime it's like, oh, you know, it could be worse. And whenever I say could be stabbed to my husband, he's always like, I mean, that's pretty extreme. I'm like, Pff. I'm going to say that to your parents next time. I yeah, see you them. should. And, and they would literally be like, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Could be worse, could be stabbed by the Manson family. 
<laughs> Could yes, and um, and I and apparently an ideal family for you to fit into. <laughs> I don't know why that popped into my head. I, oh, I let me think of the best dark. family ever. Manson family. <laughs> oh, oh. No. twist. Um, out, out of curiosity, Trevor, like because obviously, I know this is another question that you've probably answered millions and millions and millions of times before but considering this is an actor and agent podcast i should probably yes. ask it right so um what would you say to someone and i know i know your answer that you gave on crossing the line and you can you can give the exact same answer if you want um but what would you say to someone that is kind of trying to get into the voiceover industry and um like, what would you say to someone that's like just like starting out and looks up to to people like you and being like, oh, how can I possibly kind of get there? What would you say to them? Like, what well, would you be your advice? The the old answer, which is still the true answer, is <clears throat> that in the term voice acting, the most important word is acting, not voice. A lot of people are sort of laboring under the illusion that if you can do a bunch of funny voices, you can do the job, but that's not at all the case. Um, mm -hmm. you know, just because you can wear a costume well doesn't make you a good on-camera actor. Um, <clears throat> so acting is the key. You have to understand uh, how to act. You gotta know how to act. You gotta, you gotta, I, I know, whatever that means, some people are naturally and in, instinctually good at it. Some people have to take years of training and, and all sort of shades in between. Some people will never get there. And I think that's, that's where a lot of people uh, get disheartened is when they train for years but they're never really that good. Hmm. But that's life. We're not all good at the things we want to be good at. You know, I, I wish I could, uh, I wish I could draw. I can't draw to save my life. I can't even draw a straight line. I can't draw a stick man. Somehow the stick man winds up looking like it's got tentacles. I, it's just like, it's ridiculous. <laughs> but, um, but I'm so admiring of people that have talents and skills that I don't. So uh, yeah, you, you have to know how to act. You have to be realistic about your expectations. Um, mm -hmm. in one sense, it's easier than ever to get involved because now with the way that the business is open up to people everywhere because of the internet and stuff and with the pandemic, with all of us working remotely now, we can really do that. We can work from virtually anywhere. And yet, if you're trying to break into the business, I still believe, especially once all of this pandemic is over, that you still have to be in the place. You have to be in the center where the work is if you're trying to break in. There's a bunch of us who are uh, changing that paradigm, but those of us doing that have been in the business for 20 years and are established. Yeah. But if you're trying to, you gotta kind of be boots on the ground. And if you're in Canada, then, and you wanna work in animation, the city is Vancouver. Uh, if yeah. you wanna work in commercial, uh, the city is Toronto. Um, mm -hmm. in, in the States, if you wanna work in animation, the city is LA. If you want to do more corporate, more uh, uh, promo based commercial, I mean, you can do that from anywhere. But if you're trying to get in the door, probably New York <clears throat> more so. That's changing, of course. There's, there's new markets emerging. Atlanta is becoming a real hub for all kinds of stuff. But regardless <laughs> of which city it is, you, you pretty much, if you're trying to break in, you have to be there. Um, and yeah. you have to manage your expectations that it takes a long time. You know, what's the old saying that, um, an overnight success equals 20 years of hard work. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's true. You know, that's absolutely mm -hmm. true. Uh, mm -hmm. There are people who blunder into success. I, I'm sort of one of them in, in many respects. But it's interesting, though, because when I came here to L.A. and I started working, people were like, oh, my God, who's this new guy? And I'm like, new guy? I've been doing this for 15 <laughs> years at this point. <laughs> but they don't know that because to them, the whole Canadian market didn't even, it doesn't register to them. But yeah. I'd been mm -hmm. a professional voice actor for 15 years. Um, wow. <clears throat> anyway, so yeah, I would say that acting is the most important skill in the voice acting world. Uh, and you have to know, you have to be a professional too. That's the thing. You know, you got to be one of my favorite little phrases I've, or statements or whatever, bits of pearls of wisdom that I've coined is, uh, the difference between an amateur and a professional is that an amateur says, what can I get out of this? And a professional mm -hmm. says, what can I give to it? A professional yeah. says, how can I, how can I contribute to the whole to make the entire production better? Right? Mm. Yes. And that's a mindset mm -hmm. that I think that young actors, young people in general should cultivate 
early on the idea that uh, no one's in this alone. Um, you're, you're, you're always just part of a team. No matter how important you think you are, no matter how many jobs they're giving you to play lead roles, without your supporting cast, you got nothing. Without your animators, you got nothing. Without you know, your distributors, you've got nothing. The whole thing is one big team. And I think the more people that cultivate the idea that we're working as a team, the healthier your career is going to be overall. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. Lovely. Lovely. Yeah, I like how you like. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was lovely. I think that that no, goes in advice. nicely with what we, to be honest, what Snajina and I have talked about many, many times about. Um, Looking you know, at the, things the, as a whole, and yeah. Yeah. And focusing on the, the, the craft and kind of taking responsibility yeah. rather than just assuming that it's this instant Instagram right. life. Like, you know, you can become an influencer and like, oh, I'll just try, like you've said before, Sanjeev, like, oh, I'll just try modeling. Oh, I'll just try acting. Like, what? This is a career. It isn't like, isn't something you just like pick up and put down just for the sake of it. So, I no, think I that's, think that's... That's a big part of it, this, this idea that in the new era where everything is instant where social media makes everything instant. There is there is this idea, especially among younger people, that, um, oh, it's so easy to become a thing, I just do a thing, and, and it, it automatically... But every YouTuber, even just in that world, every YouTuber I've ever interacted with has always said the same thing, that they worked for years for no money, just trying to establish themselves, and yeah. if they had given up at any point, then we would have never heard of them. But they didn't, and even then, they... they uh, the, you know, there was no guarantees. There's a, a great, great, great YouTuber named Joel Haver, who I just recently found. He's one of the funniest, most absurd. He's just the weirdest guy ever. I love him. I love him so much. He makes these little comedy shorts and little animated shorts, and he's so absurd. I love it. Um, but he just got his millionth subscriber award or whatever, and so he did a little video wow. where he just he's sitting he's sitting at a picnic table on the edge of a lake. And he's just talking to his audience. He's very kind of soft-spoken, you know, and just very kind of gentle. And he's, he's just talking about what it means to live a meaningful life, really, is what he was talking about. But, but he was talking in, in terms of, like, you know, like he says, he says in his video, which just got posted a few days ago, he says, you know, I could have um, made videos based on what I thought the algorithm would reward me for. But that's not why I'm doing this. You know, I, I just followed my pa passion, followed my heart, and I created what I wanted to create. And I've been lucky enough that, you know, a million people have now decided that this is uh, <laughs> worth something. Uh, but he said, uh, he said I'm, I'm, you know, I'm most proud of the fact that I never uh, compromised my, my integrity, my sort of creative integrity. I'm totally paraphrasing him. He's, he's not as pretentious yeah, as that. Course. But, <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> When I listened to him talk, I was like, boy, did I need to hear that. Because sometimes you need to be reset. You need to remember what this is about. You know, especially here in L.A., it's it's very easy. When you get a little taste of success, it's very easy to start going off the deep end and, and to lose sight of what is important. Suddenly it becomes about the money and keeping up the jo with the Joneses and, and driving the nice car and having the bigger house. And that's all fine and good as rewards for your passion. But if that becomes the reason why you're moving forward. It's a hollow, empty existence. Um, mm -hmm. And LA is insidious for that. There's a, there's a, a veneer on this town, which <laughs> I, have a, I have a horrible uh, description of Hollywood. Uh, Hollywood is like an aging hooker. When you get close, you start to see the cracks. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, <yeah. laughs> and that's how I feel that the industry can be, um, because there's a there's a uh, an attitude, and I don't mean I don't mean in the voiceover world. People in the voiceover yeah. world tend to be just sort of, you know, laid back lunatics like myself <laughs> that they just don't take themselves particularly <laughs> seriously most of the time. But it, but in terms of the larger industry, people can really go off the deep end and, and start to overinflate their own sense of importance and especially with this world of social media and instant gratification and how many likes did you get on a thing and, and all of this absolute sort of sense of entitlement that people have and this 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 horrible narcissism that surrounds all of these apps you know like look at me taking my pictures and showing my best self when we all know it's a lie we all know this is just a staged event you're doing to try everybody knows it but everybody's complicit in the delusion and that's the thing mm. you know I've said before that 
I think social media is the greatest societal cancer that we've ever experienced. And it should be excised and cut from the body politic. But that's just my uh, particular opinion on it. Um, anyway, rant over. I don't remember what I was saying. No, we agree. Don't worry. <laughs> no, it's, okay. it's fine. I did, a, yeah. I did an interview yesterday and, and the guy said, oh, so what's your Twitter? I'm like, don't bother. I don't. I have Twitter. I don't. Never. I do not care. It, Twitter can die in a fire, and I will. My life will be not at all affected. I just do not yep. care <laughs> at all. And I know that's a detriment to my career because well, you should be using all the tools to advertise. I don't give a fuck. It's like no, I don't care. I do not care. <laughs> if people want to watch me, they'll find me and watch me. Yeah, and if exactly. I don't make You're millions good. of dollars that way, to. <laughs> to hell with it. Yeah, you know, because it's You're not about good. that. <laughs> yeah. You're good with so you So, everyone, follow at Trevor DeRoll on us. <laughs> he will never see anything you, you send him. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh, dear. My, okay, well, I, th I think this is a perfect place to draw it to a close. So, um, so, so um, if, if you guys, if you guys if enjoyed watching or listening even though I know we were just slagging off social media, please do like and su like and subscribe to the YouTube channel or follow us on Instagram or Twitter. You just look for Actor and Agent Podcast, you'll find it. Um, or give us a review that's far more meaningful. That's, that would be great. So anyway, um, so how about we all say bye on three? Is that okay? Yeah. All right. So one, <laughs> yes. One, two, three. Bye. Bye. bye.